Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm Chris Muntz, and this is episode 42, Tips and Tricks for Vocal Health, Masked or Online, with Lori Sonnenberg. Sorry, that's kind of a wordy title, but this title, this episode is actually quite short. The title is quite long. You'll figure it out real quick. In this short episode, I welcomed back Lori to the Coralosophy Coralosophy Podcast. If she's not careful, uh, she's going to end up being the official speech pathologist of the Coralosophy Podcast. But I asked her to come back and help us now, even though she's been on the show fairly recently, because of a pressing issue facing a lot of choral directors and teachers and really users of their voice on a regular basis as school comes back in all over the country. There are some unique challenges presented when we have to teach or sing in a mask. Some of us will be masked while we teach and sing. Some of us will be teaching online. So Lori has, well, many of us will be doing both. I'll be doing both. And all of those combinations of things have our voices calibrating to unnatural levels on a regular basis. So Lori is going to come in and talk to you a little bit about things you can do to head some of that damage off at the pass uh, with lots of great ideas in a very short amount of time. Plus, there's going to be some bullet points that she's created for us in the show notes, which you can find at coralosophy.com or, of course, links in the YouTube videos or any of those types of places where you get your Coralosophy podcast fix. So we hope this serves as a resource for you. Before we get to Lori, though, I want to shout out the folks that keep the lights on here at the Coralosophy podcast. Uh, Number one, the folks over at Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy is a critical group of people that is essentially their task by chipping in as little as $3 a month, goes all the way up to $10 a month for the producer level. $5 a month gets you some Coralosophy swag. We got the new trucker hat, the t-shirt. But the point is, their their task is to underwrite the recurring costs of this show. And one of the things that's been really cool about doing this show now a year and a half, year and three quarters almost, coming up on two soon uh, in the beginning of next year, is that the, the, the expenses of running a show like this are more than I thought there would be. And so the idea of being able to do it forever requires some people over at Patreon who are enjoying and appreciating the content to the point where they're willing to sign up with their $3 a month over there. They get extra content, individualized episodes for that group over there, as well as a lot of the resources that I create for my classroom, I dump onto the Patreon, uh, as well as just some behind the scenes conversations off social media, which is really cool. The show is produced on Patreon by Ryan Main, Michael Heron, Kyle Peterson, Steve and Kathy Kakachik, James Mock, and David Kowalsik. So I'm recording this just a few days before going back to school. And what going back to school for me looks like, it's kind of interesting. I've got a mix of choirs that will be in person, the ones that will be completely online, and then some that will be at some point this semester, and we don't know when, hybrid. So I get to do a little bit of all of the things that you're hearing about, which is quite fascinating. Um, I'm kind of scared about it, to be honest, but at least I am prepared. And that is in no small thanks to the sponsors of the show. Uh, The the groups of folks that I get to work with to bring you this show are such amazing vendors of choral music products, and they're really, really good people as well. So I'm going to give them a quick shout out. Of course, I'm ready to go back to school because I've got all my sight reading factory exercises built. I've got an account for me, and I've got an account for each of my students at about two bucks per student. And then you can use the Coralosophy discount code to get 10% off of the entire purchase. So I'm ready to go there with putting some of their online stuff into their school environment for us at Schoology ahead of time. So that's exciting. I've also got mymusicfolders.com involved with the show, and I've got my order of resonance singers masks on their way to the school. So when they get there, we'll be ready to rock. So they're, they're an exciting new partner to the show because not only can you get the resonance, resonance singers mask, but there's also a ton of other choral gear that they sell on mymusicfolders.com and mychoirrobes.com, which all of those you can use the Choralosophy uh, checkout code to get a 5% discount there. We are also going to be needing sheet music. I've already got a little bit. I told the vendors that I work with, I can't order as much as I normally do because we just aren't going to be together as much as I mentioned, but we're ordering some and that's really, really exciting. We've got sheet music coming to my school again, and that feels really, really good. And of course the vendors that we work with here at the Coralosophy podcast are ryanmain.com who is just Ryan main is an independent publisher, has his own website and is just masterful as a writer 
for your high school and middle school age kids in particular. They're gonna get so much meat out of the music that Ryan writes, but it's accessible and they can sound good right away. So head over to ryanmain.com. You also wanna find some sheet music, especially in this virtual environment with both of these vendors, the music comes to you instantly in a PDF. Well, think about as you're delivering your music virt virtually, how helpful that is, no scanning and all of that, right? So you can also head over to graphitepublishing.com. Graphite Publishing has a bunch of different composers and they also have an amazing search engine on there where you can choose difficulty, you can choose voicing, you can choose the, the composer from a, a stable of their composers over there. Lots of different ways to search and find music quickly on Graphite. You also have the option of heading over to vocevista.com forward slash Coralosophy and grabbing yourself what I think is one of the most amazing tools for high-tech music instruction, which is their Voce Vista video software, which allows you to see the sound wave of the singer, whether they're in the room or whether they sent you a recording that you can analyze and show them the analysis that you've given to their recording, which is a really cool thing. Uh, the plus, of course, you can download it for free and play with it for 30 days. And then if you try to use it after that 30th day, they'll make you try to buy it like a lot of softwares are. At that point, any of these vendors, you can enter Coralosophy at checkout to get 10% off. With no further ado, here is Lori Sonnenberg telling you how to keep your voice healthy as we go back to school. All right, I'm here with Lori Sonnenberg, who is, of course, now the first official repeat guest on the Coralosophy podcast. No pressure. Uh, welcome, Lori. Welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I, I feel honored to be the first repeat guest. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I thought it would be appropriate. Uh, you reached out with an idea to talk about some vocal health issues that are facing people in a unique time right now. And as the school year gets started, we're going to try to get this episode turned out real quickly for people because, uh, as we all know, people are coming back to school, but they're coming back to a new type of school and in many cases, they're coming back to lots of different types of school, uh, like my, my situation. I've got some online, some hybrid, some in person, uh, doing all kinds of things, which means that as teachers, we're also going to be using our voice in all kinds of new and strange ways. And so, of course, Lori's expertise is helping us work through that and think through that so that it doesn't kind of come up and bite us later. Um, so welcome again. And I'm excited to kind of bust through some of the best uh, things to think about and maybe things to look out for uh, as we begin teaching. So let's start out, uh, if, if it's okay, thinking in terms of any type of voice use for any extended, of time, extended period of time where a mask is involved. What are the types of things we should be thinking about? Oh, well, definitely. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind is the volume increase that we're noticing uh, as we speak wearing a mask. I don't know about you, uh, but when I'm in a mask, uh, now I'm, I'm uh, online and virtual for all of my treatment right now uh, with patients and, and voice uh, and singers. But when I'm in public and I'm wearing a mask, uh, I absolutely notice that I'm raising the volume of my voice, no matter what type of environment I'm in. Uh, and we're, I actually have a voice specialist colleague uh, who's out in California and uh, Dr. Rena Gupta and she did a fun little experiment one day to uh, to measure the decibel level of her speech when she was wearing not wearing a mask and then compared to when she was wearing a mask and there was like a ten, you know a, a, I think it was close to 10 decibel increase in uh, how loud she was speaking so volume is definitely the number one increased volume Vol increased volume is uh, probably the, the number one thing that I think of. Uh, in relationship to that, um, I think our volume is being affected by, we, we when we're wearing a mask, we, we're having sort of this strange perception of volume. Uh, and even if we're not in a noisy environment, uh, that interaction with people is changing our perception of how loud we are. Uh, and then the uh, Another response to increased volume is that we automatically raise our effort. That's an involuntary uh, thing that happens. But you know, the Lombard effect: vol uh, in volume goes up, effort goes up, and so those are, are probably the main things that you know we're thinking about uh, in terms of wearing the mask. Um, there's uh, also 
even though studies, I, I'm pretty sure that across the board, studies have not shown that speech recognition is altered and lowered a whole lot with like wearing a surgical mask, for example. Uh, and these are older studies. I don't think they're being done so much right now yet, but speech recognition is not necessarily affected uh, with a mask for the listener of normal hearing. Mm -hmm. But when you have uh, an individual with any level of hearing loss, it's going to make their ability to understand speech recognition and uh, or what we call speech intelligibility lower. So, and, and the reality is there are a lot of us walking around in the world with hearing loss and we don't know it. Yeah. That's, that's very, especially for some, some musicians that have had their ears blasted with noise for so long. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And so, so it's just sort of like the, the combination of all these things, noise level. Another thing is noise level in the room, uh, the teaching space, uh, whether it's ambient noise or chitter chatter from the students or, uh, and then you add the physical distancing. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on <laughs> in right. that environment. You know what? I, I feel sometimes when I'm trying to use my mask around students and my school year is just starting, so I haven't had very many chances yet, but, uh, but I know it'll be an issue already, is that there's a certain self-consciousness that I feel that I know they can't read my lips and I know they can't see my facial expression. And that also, I, I find myself, like you said, increasing my effort vocally um, to try to get through to that. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely see that as being an issue, especially if I'm going to be teaching, you know, for seven hours. Well, and, and not only that just, the, you, you know, we think about the, the full hour hours of teaching in the course of a teaching day, but then, um, I'm hearing from a lot of my patients that their, uh, their class periods and the blocking related to that is being changed. Uh, and what I'm hearing the most is that the class periods are getting longer. And, uh, and so then we're, we're at this level for a much longer period of time. Right. Yeah. So let's say we, let's say we know then uh, we heard, uh, heard Lori on the Coralosophy podcast, talk through some big issues that go, that are going to face us. So we know that we're going to be talking louder because we're going to be trying harder. Uh, we're going to have an, an incorrect maybe perception of how loud we are because we've got that mask covering us. We've, we're going to be trying harder. We're going to, the students might not understand us quite as well, especially if they have a speech issue or a, sorry, a hearing issue, uh, noise level in the classroom. Of course, that's a big one. Our, our classroom management is going to play into this too. How, how, how much can we convince the kids that they have to be quiet so that we can get anything done? But let's say we know all that stuff, right? What are the things that you would recommend that we do to uh, uh, ahead of time to kind of stave off some of the damage? Uh, well, the, the three, I think, top things are uh, the warm up and the, the resetting of the voice off and on throughout the day. And we probably talked about that last time I was on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm going to give some samples, if you'd like, today uh, of some things I think could be really helpful. Yeah. Uh, with regard to those things. Uh, secondly, uh, using uh, what we call a personal voice amplification system. Uh, I think that that is essential right now uh, for those of you who are in the classroom wearing masks, especially teaching music. But even my uh, educators who are not musicians and not in choral settings, I'm also recommending the amplification. In addition to the mask, I have some things I can show you today about how to use that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the, um, the taking breaks off and on throughout the day. So getting uh, what we call vocal pacing or uh, just getting little naps uh, and time down for your voice to rest in between class periods. Those are probably the top, top three. Great. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you have to show us? Oh, okay. Well, well, so, in fact, if, and for listeners, if you're listening on the audio only, this of course will go on YouTube as well. And you can use the same timestamp that you're listening to on your podcast app right now. And you can jump over to YouTube and see what yeah. Laura's showing us. So first, um, I'd just like to show you what I mean when I say personal voice amplification system. Uh, the What I'm referring to is something very small. So you can see here this little speaker um, uh -huh. that has a clip on the back of it. Um, 
this is a wireless version of this. They do come in wired versions where it connects to the speaker, but here's the speaker. And then this is the example of what we would call a, you know, a headset, like this is the headset microphone, uh -huh. uh, but it can be worn two different ways. It can be worn on the head like this. Um, but my favorite way right now is having you wear it around your neck. So it has this little loop that you can wear around the neck and the microphone is able, you can just move it around. So your voice comes out of this speaker. Now I'm, I'm, uh, I should be live with this and it just changes the sound a little bit. You can hear my voice is coming through okay. this speaker. These are very small, but they are very powerful. And uh, the thing that's nice, these little speakers can be, you know, set up anywhere uh, in your classroom uh, to face the students. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's something that's something that'd be very useful. And I know we're not really here to promote a brand. Of, of those, but could just, could you give us a ballpark of how much something like that, that you just showed us costs? Absolutely. I think I paid around $70 for this one. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, and it's wireless. So, and I say uh, the wireless is uh, probably cost twice as much as the wired version, but it's worth every penny. <laughs> especially with the mask. Yes. Especially. Yeah. And, and they all are Bluetooth uh, accessible. So you can play musical tracks through them and they can connect with your uh, mobile devices and different things. Um, so this is one that I use a lot when I lecture uh, with people. This was before the time of masks, of course. Um, another little, uh, another one that I have, that looks very similar, little speaker. Um, they're widely available online uh, and uh, you, know, you just Google personal voice sample system wireless and you're going to get a lot of options right uh, yeah so I have a mask here and I thought I would show you the way this would work with a mask so I'm going to put this on I'm going to take my glasses off here and so now I'm I've got my mask this one's got a little bit of room in it and my options are to wear this so now I've got my mask on I don't have anything else on my head or behind my ears, but I've just got this mic sitting in front. So right. that, that's one option. The other option is to actually, if, you're, if your mask is really roomy, like the resonance or the singer's mask, you can actually put the microphone up inside like this, and you've got more room in there, and it, and it changes the intelligibility a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I experimented that with the resonance mask of my own. Um, I put the the microphone head on the inside of the mask, and then the, it, it's nice because you can still seal the mask around your face, and so you just kind of tuck the the cord in. And uh, so, yeah, it can, I think it could be done either way. I'm I'm going to play with it in front of my my students next week and just say ask what ask what sounds better. The, yeah, and I think you have to experiment. Another thing that you can do, um, you know, say, for example, someone uh, just doesn't have the funds for this or, uh, they, or they're waiting for it. Uh, they're very popular right now, so they're on back order. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, I'm hanging on to my two and, like, guarding them. Uh, so, but one of the things, another idea is if you're concerned about, well, what is my volume level and uh, how do I gauge that? Uh, you can, there, there are some apps that help you measure like decibel levels of your voice, like a sound level meter, or um, there's a voice tool app that where you can record something and then it gives you the data about how loud you are. You could put your mask on and you could measure and just kind of get an idea in the space. Um, right. You know, sometimes just plugging up the ear, you know, while you're speaking, if you plug your ear up with either a little ear plug or your finger, you know, and close your ear canal. Uh, it gives you a little better awareness for how loud you're speaking. Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a great idea. And I hadn't yeah. even thought, I thought, hadn't thought of an, a decibel measure measuring app because yeah. my, uh, um, since, especially because the way I framed the question earlier, where what are, what are things teachers could be doing ahead of time before this becomes a problem? And that sounds yeah. like a really good, uh, like if you don't have students in the room to ask, am I loud enough? you could use one of those decibel apps uh, to get just to get a little bit of a baseline for how much softer the mask makes you. 
Um, yeah, what- and and another idea, and this is a little more trouble, but I'm encouraging all of my uh, educator patients to uh, record themselves, like do demos in the classroom when you're by yourself, make recordings, go back and listen and say, well, which one do I understand better when my mic is here on the inside, on the outside? Uh, just You have to kind of do trial and error to figure out what works really well. Right. Yeah, so far I've I've discovered that singing in in a singer's mask is actually easy, pretty easy. It's talking in a mask that's hard. Um, but just for all the reasons we discussed, you kind of feel like you have to work hard to be understood. But when you're singing, you're already kind of resonating more, um, and so it doesn't quite have the same effect. So I think this is going to be a big important thing. Well, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, I was just going to say, like, so maybe I could talk a little bit about how, like, what to do. When you when you start to feel your effort level increasing, because it I feel like it's kind of a snowball effect Like you get that you start to feel effortful and you're like, oh, I kind of noticed that. But I'm going to keep going because class is almost over (laughs) and you and you just keep going through it. And then the effort is higher and higher and higher. Uh, And you need to gauge that. And then you need a way to just really quickly eliminate that effort and reset the vocal folds reset the voice to a baseline level where you're not working so hard. And my favorite way to do that, uh, and I'm going to demonstrate this out of the mask first, then I'm going to put the mask on and show you how it can work um, in that. So we use, in speech pathology, we use occluded sounds to reset the vocal folds and bring them to that desirable shape and position. And what I mean by that is, uh, anything where the, the mouth is a little more closed. So uh, humming, of course, is the first thing we think of, like, mm, because we use that back pressure. So that back pressure inside is coming back and helping those vocal folds relax and set up. So uh, one of my favorite ones is what I call the kazoo, a buzzy kazoo. It kind of sounds something like this. So it's almost like a little embouchure type shape to the lips. Uh huh. Um, it helps if I think of WH. If you think, now, I don't want to. I don't want to make you. I don't want to make you feel self conscious. But through Zoom, it sounds like a whale. But go go. <laughs> Also use um, a, a colleague of mine. I, I watched a little demo that she did, and she talked about using uh, your knuckles, like placing the knuckles on the lips to buzz uh-huh. the lips against your hand. Like so, just that sound right there, that simple, resets those vocal folds and changes their shape and position. Very easy to do that behind the mask. I'm gonna. Put this on here and show you. So I can set that up. Now you could use humming, but I like it where the lips are a little open. And so, and then you can even use your hand like my friend was talking about. So you can do single pitches, you can move it around just kind of up and down. It's kind of like straw phonation. Right. Can you hear the similarities? Yes. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And to me, it sounds like we've got two potential benefits here. Number one, you're, you are just warming up the mechanism, like you said, just kind of preparing and relaxing and, and that kind of thing. But secondly, you're also getting used to what you sound like in a mask. And, yes. and, and, and the more used to it you become, the, the easier it will be to calibrate, to kind of set your own volume level. That's yes, kind because of- I've been experimenting with this a lot out in public and if I needed to, to speak a lot and I'll, I'll, I'll try it and just now that's the sound I use anyway, so it's very familiar to me, but I'll do it for even just 30 seconds. 
and my voice feels so much better after I do it. It just resets things. And then I feel like, okay, my effort's down and I can keep going. Right. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a great idea. Now, what about the teachers who are still um, not seeing students in person? So they're still spending quite a bit of time on Zoom or other uh, some other type of virtual teaching tool. What are some pitfalls for vocal health related to long term on the computer? Well, again, number one, increased volume, which then brings increased effort. So we're seeing that also. I mean, we've all been at this for a while here now online, (laughs) but most of us uh, in some form or fashion. And I think we all have gone through periods of adjusting to Zoom fatigue and uh, and the online teaching fatigue. And it's not just mental and physical, but vocal. So the volume is an important thing. And so I think it's really important to work with your equipment and, uh, you know, especially if you're wearing headphones, uh, the open back headphones are so much better uh, for hearing and perception of your own voice when teaching online. Uh, so I, I recommend the open back headphones. So oh, the other thing is, um, you know, use of If you don't want to wear headphones, using like a USB mic that plugs into your device can be really helpful for changing your perception of the volume. Also, like where where I am right now with you, I'm facing a wall. So my my device and my mic and everything just three feet in front of me is the wall of this room. And it allows my voice to bounce like right back to me rather than going out into a big open space. Okay. And that, yeah. that helps a lot, the wall in front of you. That's a, yeah, that's a great, great idea. I, I hadn't thought of that either, just to kind of build your own little sound booth, so to speak, so that you're not having to work so hard, especially if you're spending considerable amounts of time uh, teaching online. But it sounds like the, the, the theme between the two, so the teaching it in person with a mask, teaching online, is, there are similar problems. That we're that we're creating, we're just using our voices in ways that we're not used to. Um, we're having to increase our effort, uh, so the so finding ways to make the most efficient voice use. Also, you talked about warming up being important, resetting the voice. All of those things are are, are excellent advice. What are what are we missing? Anything else you need to fill in our gaps or show us anything else? Well, I just want to mention. So, with regard to the resetting the voice while you're either in the mask or out of the mask. Um, you know, any of our semi included vocal track sounds uh, that we know and love, uh, things that are, are familiar to your voice, lip trills, tongue trills, humming, buzzing, any of those things are, are going to do the job. Uh, it's just I picked that one because I find it's very easy to do behind the mask, uh, lip trills and sticking the tongue out and doing all these things like it makes it wet in the mask and you don't want to want right. to go here, right? <laughs> We're trying to minimize. <laughs> Um, the one thing I think we, we missed maybe, um, is the idea of like your physical body posture and positioning, uh, that has a tremendous effect on what we're doing, especially for, uh, if you're seated. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I, everybody's experimenting with their setup. Are they sitting on a stool or a chair or, you know, what are, uh, the dining room chair? I'm thinking a lot of people are in the dining room chair, you know, and, it, it doesn't facilitate great posture for voice. And so just making sure that the upper body is, is nice and tall, the chest is elevated, the shoulders are down and relaxed um, so that you've got this nice, long, tall instrument here. Uh, and if you're seated, making sure to be really aware of lower body and breath connection. And because that, that will also affect uh, just those extended periods of voice. If the voice is not connected, I always say, don't be a singing or a talking head. Make sure it's, it's connected, you know, to you and that you feel that connection. So I think that's probably the only other thing. Yeah. I think that, that reminding people to breathe is also a really important thing. And I'm thinking, I'm just knowing myself, can see myself being in a, in a classroom setting soon where I've got this mask on, they're having trouble understanding me and in my frustration my, my repeating of the instruction over and over might become exasperated. It might become uh, not as healthy of a vocal production uh, where I might just r- want to remind myself to just 
that, okay, they can understand you. You might just need to resonate a little bit more, take a breath. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I had, um, I had a patient last week, uh, a, a music educator, choral director. I think she worked with um, elementary students and um, it, it was really fun session because after we did our therapy exercises and warmed up and did all the things we needed to do, I, she basically taught me on Zoom. I said, I want you to pretend like I'm your student. I want you to just show me, show me what you're doing and demonstrate for me. And it was so enlightening to me because I, I got to hear exactly the way she was putting the sound out in the songs that she was using with her young students. And right away, I picked up on, I, I said to her, her, are you even taking a breath in between those phrases? You know, and, and she was like, gosh, I hadn't even really paid attention to that or thought about that. And this is, a, uh, this is someone that clearly knows about the importance of, of breath connection. You know, it's not like she doesn't know that. <laughs> right. So yeah. um, I, I think that's a that's a wonderful uh, additional thing just to pay attention to. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I just, my son just walked in. I'll have to edit that out. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right. Well, yes. Thank you so much. I think I think we've covered all the points. Uh, do you, uh, while I'm kind of in an edit zone anyway. Do you did we do you want to hit anything else? No, I'm just looking real quick to see if uh, the only thing I didn't say anything about was cooling down. That might be okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, so a final uh, little suggestion that can be really helpful after a long day of teaching and voice use, no matter what the environment is. Uh, is the concept of the cool down, the vocal cool down. It's not really all that different uh, than our semi-occluded vocal tract sounds. and uh, But pitch gliding, especially descending pitch gliding, is really, really helpful for that cool down. The, the concept of the cool down is to, uh, after a lot of intensity and a lot of, uh, a lot of use and fatigue, we sort of reset again but we bring that intensity down for just a few minutes at the end of the teaching day. So I use lip trills for my cool down all the time. So I, I, I'll, on the way home or when I'm done making dinner, after I finish working, I'll. It can just, it can be that light. Yeah. It's just that really subtle, light, easy uh, voicing with the straw, with the lip trill. And just doing that for five minutes at the end of the day can reduce uh, uh, fatigue and reduce swelling the next day. Wow. Yeah. And just and just reminding your body to make tension-free noises. Right. Just yeah. take time to just kind of, you know, come down off that high from so much intensity. Yep. Uh, I think that if you were to experiment with that, you would, you would notice the benefits. Yeah, that's great. Well, Lori, thank you so much for coming on and giving us the uh, uh, the reminders of of things that we would normally want want to be teaching our students. But right now, we're putting our voices through the ringer for those students. So we are, uh, and we and we're grateful helping. to all of you for doing that. Uh, yeah. for us parents, and uh, we're we're grateful for that. But it is a, it isn't easy. It really isn't. And, you know, everyone should know that we're all experiencing the same things. Uh, and, uh, and if, you know, there are any questions, I'm happy to follow up. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and we'll, we'll be in touch soon. Okay, great. Thanks for okay. having me. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, as always, for sticking around to the end of the episode. I hope if you're still here, that means you are one of the diehards and you've got something out of this. Or if you're not one of the diehards and you're new to the Coralosophy podcast, wow, gold star for you. You're sticking around, listening, and hopefully getting something out of the content that we produce here. If that's the case, whether you're a longtime listener or a new listener, there are some things that I always ask for to be for you to do to help at the end, ranging in ranging widely in levels of commitment. So if you've got a commitment problem, we'll start with the low commitment things first. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so. If you haven't yet left a rating on the podcast, these are things that are quick and easy. So if you're in an Apple podcast, you can leave a rating to whatever level of stars you find appropriate or on Facebook, you can actually find the Coralosophy podcast and leave a rating there too. These are things that help people, other people find the show, just boosts our 
visibility a little bit. Whenever you interact with Coralosophy podcast content, whether it be Facebook posts or Instagram or on the podcast app itself, it helps people see the show, generates interest. So that's low level commitment. Next level commitment, of course, is head over to those sponsors and use the code. That's how they know you're listening. So again, those are vocevistavideo.com forward slash Coralosophy, sightreadingfactory.com, graphitepublishing.com, ryanmain.com and mymusicfolders.com. Every time you make a purchase there, you can dump in that Coralosophy podcast code and get your tight budget a discount. So that's another layer of commitment to helping out the show in its mission. And of course, there's the patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy is another layer of commitment where you can decide to pledge $3 a month or more to, to show your appreciation, but also to help the, underwrite the costs of the show so that I can keep doing this forever and continue to talk with you and converse with you and hopefully help with some of the things that you are going for, through. Or maybe you just like to hear me talk, but any for whatever reason, you can jump over there. But the big things are to interact, send in emails with your requests of things to talk about, Join the Coralosophers Facebook page. There's lots of ways to be involved. Let's build a community and let's keep talking. Thanks a lot, everybody.